Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Cartel Hour, where we do live tastings and discussions of all kinds of spirits with the people who make them, use them, and enjoy them. My name is Cameron Stevens. And my name is Seth Benheim. Together, we're covering everything from familiar bottles to rare and exclusive releases from near and far away. If it's distilled, it's on the podcast. Featured in Rolling Stone, GQ, Men's Journal, and more, we bring celebrity guests, master distillers, and industry veterans to chat about the latest in the spirits world. Mezcal is sometimes seen as the little brother to tequila, but the world of Mezcal is actually far wider reaching than tequila, especially considering tequila is actually just a subset of the wider family of Mezcal. Made from any variety of agave, not just Blue Weber, Mezcal is known in Oaxaca with the saying, para todo mal, Mezcal, y para todo bien, también, which translates to for everything bad, Mezcal, and for everything good as well. For this episode, we brought on Mezcal expert, Max Reese. Now, just looking at the long-haired, tattooed metal rocker, you wouldn't exactly guess a Mezcal connoisseur, But the man has worked in the alcohol industry since he was of legal age and has spent enough time getting his hands dirty with the Mescaleros south of the border that he has indisputably earned that title. We talk about the various methods of fermentation, including leather sacks, yes, leather sacks, as well as methods of creation that range from artisanal to ancestral. If you want to listen to an extremely passionate expert on Mezcal and learn an absolute ton about the spirit, Max is the one. A quick note, we don't usually do disclaimers because, well, this is a show on spirits where we drink and we swear and we have a good time, but just so everyone knows, there are some topics involving religion and some of the cocktails that Max has been notorious for that might be a bit sensitive for some people. But that's all I'm going to say. So without further ado, we're here to learn a little bit and drink a little bit. So grab a glass and let's enjoy. Welcome back to the Infusory for another episode of the Cartel Hour. My name is Cameron Stevens. My name is Seth Benheim. Oh man, and we've got we've got so much mezcal in front of us today. Uh, this is an episode entirely on mezcal, so we had to bring in Max Reese. You're at Gracias Madre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here in Los yeah. Angeles. So I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about your background, um, how you kind of got into mezcal. And, and and how you got into the position where you are at today um, to kind of gain all the knowledge that, you know, before we even started this, I was like, this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, tell us your story, Max. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a Jewish kid from Napa, California. Uh, moved to L.A. when I graduated high school and uh, started being in a touring metal band. Uh, I was working what was it called? At, uh, Mouth of the Serpent. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah so you're very metal. Uh, Yeah, so I was working in restaurants uh, in between touring and whatnot um, to make ends meet. Uh, Turned uh, around 20. I decided, uh, although I was making really good money as a server, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So I started bar backing, took a big pay cut uh, because I need to be creative in my work and learning or else I don't really enjoy it. Fair enough. Uh, So the day I turned 21, I was uh, bartending. They promoted me to bartender. So I started, uh, you know, obviously trying to absorb as much as I could throughout that process. And uh, I think I was 22 years old. And I remember one of my friends actually brought me a bottle of mezcal and a water bottle back from Mexico. Uh, his family that he had brought back. <laughs> yeah, The uh, authentic way to bring things back, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually, it's become a big trend in my life. <laughs> but uh, Water bottle mezcal? Oh, yeah, big yeah, time. There you go. Like if that. it's in a water bottle, you know it's good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I tried it, and um, it wasn't, you know, the stuff that you read about, like that they sell in the Oaxacan airport with the worm in it, you know, um, which isn't always bad, by the way, the worm component, the stuff in the airport is, but, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, Don't yeah. Don't fear the worm. Yeah. yeah. Don't uh, fear the worm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was, uh, so I, I tried it, and it was um, a very positively jarring experience for me. It was, it was this very extreme spirit that really stuck with me and um, none was commercially available in the United States at the time. So uh, as I started seeing it, it really piqued my interest and I was, you know, working in other bars in Los Angeles, um, such as, you know, like Republic. I was doing some uh, beverage consulting. Um, so uh, basically, you know, with whiskey, it's challenging because if you want to get into it, there's someone that's got 50 years on you. But with Mescal, 
this was kind of the first opportunity that we had been able to, as a culture, imply an American level of fascination to a spirit that was often overlooked even by the people of Mexico. So, um, yeah, it was just from there, it was became my focus outside of cocktails and running cocktail programs, which is kind of the other half of my... But about your cocktail, so I, I'm, and I know Max... Um, <laughs> You're like ready to get into it. I like that. From, <laughs> now where are the... Co- no. So, you know, I know Max from outside the podcast, and I've been to a few of your events, uh, which yeah. have included some Metal Mondays and some other... Types of and are of, these at Gracias Madre? No, this no, was, one, was of, a, one of these was at a place called the Mermaid down here in uh, Little Tokyo. And, oh, okay. You know, there's been some. Qu- I don't want to say questionable, but <laughs> I'll say I'll say interesting. Yeah, yeah. Interesting uh, cocktail ingredients, and we wouldn't be doing all of ourselves a disservice to not talk about right. these. <laughs> and I only I'm only talking about the ones I know of, which mm-hmm. have included. And correct me if I get this wrong. Human breast milk. So that one, <laughs> not quite as much. Uh, that has been something I've been really wanting to do, which was... Uh, oh, you haven't done it. Well, kind of. So, it came uh, up. It so, came up one look, time. Look, you either do or you well, don't. Okay, so the fine line there is I have not... I've been joking about doing a clarified <laughs> breast milk punch for a long time um, to the point where I've talked to my friends that are lactating and uh you know and that's been uh, a topic wow. a hot to the topic. point where seth thought it was a real thing already oh, i thought it had happened yeah. oh, well i mean well t- <laughs> to, to add to that further um so i also got, was consulting for cafe gratitude when they were trying to launch a restaurant line that actually did full-on cocktails mm-hmm. and uh i did make a cocktail with a product that is powdered breast milk bacteria got it uh so that was the closest i've come but although that was pretty fun because that was actually in a public setting and not just at a pop-up that was just like it's on the menu Come on in. Oh, <laughs> man. Come down. Yeah, have at it. But that was one of them. But the other ones, um, I believe, included uh, you imported water from Vatican City. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you did a holy cocktail or an unholy uh, cocktail? All or? of them, actually. So uh, <laughs> it was a death metal pop-up, a black metal pop-up. I basically did different cocktails, things around different metal genres, aesthetically and ingredient-wise. And the concept for the first one, which you were at, what, at The Mermaid, was I actually, rather than using citrus, bought holy water that was from the river Jordan blessed in the vat again and sold online for like mega churches. Ah. Um, and I actually acidically <laughs> balanced it if using only they knew if uh, only they knew what was happening. Yeah, with that yeah, water yeah, I know, right? Yeah. When they sold it. Oh God. Background it, checks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh God. But yeah, so I essentially just, um, took it and I used citric and malic acid to acidically balance it to replace citrus. And so all the cocktails, rather than having citrus, had acidically balanced holy water in its place. Oh so God. that's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, then that's pretty cool. And this this may be controversial for for many. Um, so cover your ears if you're a devout religious person. But <laughs> right. you burnt a Bible and yeah. used the ashes to make a cocktail. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a burnt. <laughs> I call it unholy. This is the first episode job. we're gonna get calls on. Right. Like, yeah. Fuckers. Well, you yeah. know what? We, we no, but I do. I want to. I want to hear this story. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, I called it Unholy Orgeat, which is usually like a nut milk-based syrup used in tiki. Uh, I just took some Bibles and burnt them and turned it into a syrup with some orange flower water and rose flower water. Is that, and is that fully editable? That's like you can ingest a burnt book? I uh, mean... And- it's good for you. Or My you, rationale. You cook it in good any way, for you like, is, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, is a line, you know, it's a gray area. Well, you know, like Bible paper is really thin. And I remember in, <laughs> that's, that's the justification. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's a tree, right? Oh, man. Well, I just remember in high school that was uh, if people were out of rolling papers when smoking weed, they would roll it in Bible paper because it's the thinnest texture to roll oh papers. Oh, my God. So in that, uh, I was like, you know, if <laughs> people. Double have, down. Yeah, this. exactly. There goes your listeners. Uh, I just figured if multiple people I know had used it and smoked it it'd probably be okay if you ate a like a, a minuscule amount you know yeah so it maybe it wasn't it wasn't that many bibles it's just, just yeah it, that. it was dispersed yeah i mean it was, it was cool it wasn't yeah. that many bibles yeah. now these are the ones i know of is there anything else worth mentioning that kind of peeks out at that sort of the 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 maximum level the <laughs> one of my favorite ones that i did at sunny's hideaway was i did an egyptian themed milk punch uh, for this egyptian metal band called nile and that one um, I actually did. Uh, so there's this thing called clarified milk punch where you curdle milk and you strain a punch through it to remove yep, the yep, color, yep. Uh, which is what I was joking about using the breast milk with. Um, I actually bought camel milk and I curdled oh, the cool. camel milk and did it with Interesting. that. Interesting. Where did you get camel milk? Where else but the internet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
yeah, it was it was really funny. I mean, and it's like that that's to crazy. me is like metal to me is like it, although it has this serious aesthetic, like in reality, it's just a bunch of people having fun, and it's just a joke. You know, it, there's not an actual level of severity to any of this. So, you know, to me, it was just kind of like poking fun at the lighthearted, you know, aesthetic to me of metal and. So, you know, obviously I'm not a, a Satanist, uh, you know, I just don't particularly have any religious beliefs. So this was yeah. just fun for me to kind of, the more, poke no, the no phone. guilt, no, no, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, religious, you know, sort of, um, weight on your shoulders in that sense. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. Gives you a little more creativity and freedom than, than say the average Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I like the way you're thinking about that. So like if you, so what is, what is to you, what is metal about Mezcal? Oh, about Mezcal? Yeah. I mean, it's. Mescal is just what, you know, I do have a fascination with metal because I think it's this beautiful genre that with complexity and, but people, when they first listen to it, they're like, oh my God, that is so abrasive. Turn it off, turn it down. A lot of the time people have the same reaction to Mescal when you pour it for them. It's this big in your face thing, Uh, okay. you know, and, uh, but then once you kind of peel back that initial layer, you find a lot of nuance and beauty and intelligence and, it, it takes somebody uh, to let their guard down to kind of get on in there. So I love that. Now, before, because this is a question I, I, I knew I was going to ask. Now's probably the time to do it. You say Mezcal. I've been saying Mezcal. Is there a right, wrong? You, you know, I think this this is a good time to kind of just say with Mezcal, just remember that each one of these things is from a region in Mexico where they all have a different opinion and they all tell you that they're right. There's different ways to spell different varietals. There's different places where they call things differently. And sure. you go down to Mexico and you're in Michoacan or you're in um, Guadalajara, or you're in these different parts of the, of the region, mm-hmm. you're going to have different ways of saying things. It's inevitable. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's, it's even more like hypersensitive in Oaxaca and they're all very opinionated that they're doing it right. And to the point where like I've met people that are like, Everyone does it this way. And I go, that's not what they say. And they go, they're just trying to keep their secret. They're, they're secretly doing it the way I'm doing it. They just don't want to tell you because this is the only way to do it. This is the only way to say it. It's like pizza in New York or Chicago. You yeah. know, there's different so, ways to make the same thing. Right. Because I'm happy to make the, the pivot today. If it is mezcal, I can, I can get it behind mezcal. that. Mezcal. I mean, mezcal. Mez- I mean, I guess mezcal. that's how I mezcal. say it. But okay. I mean, you got to learn all the rules before you break them. But trust me, there's, there, there are no rules, but there are <laughs> modern Modern rules, <laughs> you know, so. Well, I like that. Well, well, why don't we do this? Because I know um, I really want to get into breaking down some of the aspects of Mezcal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, but I, I, we have a huge lineup in front of us yeah. that I think, well, what do we have? Seven bottles total, right? Oh, yeah. I got more um, in my trunk. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you came prepared. Um, so I, so I, I kind of want to pepper the, the, the knowledge in as we kind of go through these. So. Mm-hmm. Why don't we uh, Why don't we start at the beginning, huh? Um, yeah, we're gonna start with uh, a mezcal called the Creyente. Creyente, yeah. Creyente, yeah. and now uh, this is Creyente Hoven, and it is a blend of two different mezcals, uh, both Espadine, and they're both uh, mezcals from Oaxaca, mm-hmm. and they're produced differently and distilled separately, and then blended after distilled. Okay. Yep. So. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, grab let's that, grab dive that in. first glass. Kinda, cool. We'll kind of talk a little bit about uh, what we're getting. Now, are you familiar with Carante? Uh Yeah, I've, I've had their, I've seen their lineup. Um, it's actually a beautiful bottle, um, so it stuck out my mind. I believe this particular. Yeah, what is on this bottle? There's like a leopard with wings or something. I'm not sure of the mythology behind that that creature there, but sounds about right. Um, and this is a 40 percent, uh, 80 proof on this one, guys. So. What I would say, uh, just kind of since we're touching on the proof there, is that uh, this is an Americanized product. Oh, yeah. So uh, I think I saw it at Target one time. So definitely yeah. Americanized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which was shocking, actually. I didn't think Target had it in them to Tar- buy some. Target oh, had, yeah. a, Target had a, a leopard with wings on it. So I this, appreciate that. So this yep. is an introductory mescal. And, and the reason I say that is because there's uh, a test that basically you would do as a proof of quality in Oaxaca. Uh, called the pearls test, right? So 
uh, or Las Perlas. So Las Perlas. Yeah, there's a bar downtown here in LA called Las yes, Perlas. Yes, there That's is, and it's after. a fantastic uh, it is, bar. It yeah, is great. It's, it's great. So the whole deal is, is basically in Oaxaca, if I was to sell you my mezcal as a producer, what you would do is you would essentially pour it from a distance into a, a vessel, and the bubbles that appear would be called the pearls. And because of the large essential oil content in mezcal comparatively to other spirits, those pearls, how big they are and how long they last on top of your beverage will help a mescalero determine the ABV. So they don't need, they, they can see those bubbles and they'll know this is X amount of alcohol in this batch. So wow. b- beneath 44.8, I believe is the cutoff. Those pearls do not appear. So anything below that is considered an Americanized product because it would not classically be deemed acceptable ah. by the mescal community. Do they call that Nas Perlas? Nas no? Perlas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I like so, that. So. There you go. Nice. But um, basically, you know, it's mezcal is really expensive, and it should be, um, especially when you go down there and you see it uh, in its production. It should be an expensive product. And uh, one of the ways that they introduced it to the American public was to dumb down that alcohol content a little bit to make it a little bit more accessible for noobs and yep. uh, down to 40, which is the classic American right, uh, tequila right. percentage. Yeah. We're what sugar. do we think about this one? So, I mean, so the first thing that I guess I should kind of talk to you guys about, and that's something I always talk to my guests about, is that mezcal being of a higher proof, even though this is at 40, it to me requires to be as a, you taste a lot of high proof spirits. So I'm sure you're aware of how to taste high proof spirits. But I always let people know, crack your mouth open a little bit, smell it with your mouth cracked, so that way that the large alcohol content doesn't blow out your taste buds and your olfactory system. And then they always tell you with mescal, take a sip, let your palate basically go into shock from the high alcohol content, <laughs> go back in for a second sip quick, and that's when you're actually going to get the subtleties. So, And if I were to describe mescal to someone who has never mm-hmm. had it before, mm-hmm. um, but is familiar with tequila, I would try to draw similarities if you've ever had a very peaty scotch as a baseline as a very crude understanding of the category of mezcal and a lot of that is attributed to the process or the way in which it's made Um, but beyond that it is certainly with varying degrees a smokier Mm -hmm. um, and especially in this glass very vegetal uh, version mm. that doesn't have generally, again, uh, yep. quite the same amount of sweetness. Now, Max, how would you describe mezcal in your own words, yep. essentially, to somebody trying it for the first time? That's a big thing for me because uh, working at a, a mezcal bar, a lot of people would describe it, including brands, which is hilarious to me. They'll lean into misconception and they'll describe it as like a smoky tequila. And the whole yeah. thing is that just like champagne, you know, the region in Champagne can is the only region that can produce champagne, and it has to be particular kinds of grapes. Tequila can only be made up using Blue Weber Agave and then made in four notable regions, the main one being Jalisco. Mezcal literally translates to cooked agave, and to the people that make it all agave spirit technically is cooked agave and therefore is mezcal. Right. So mezcal though, however, you have to trace back to the origins of tequila and that's what it kind of hangs on to a bit more, which is that tequila or sorry, tequila is roasted in an oven uh, to create a smokeless cleaner flavor profile and more efficiency. Mezcal is roasted in a subterranean oven. So basically you dig a big pit in the ground, you take a bunch of wood and uh, often volcanic rock. You light this giant fire as it cools uh, the next morning and has smoldered and the rocks are hot. You take all these agave pinas or the heart of the agave, put it on there, basically cover it with dirt, and you let it steam itself underground. So uh, that's where your smoke is going to come from, and that's uh, not a misconception. The smoke is trapped underground in this sort of um, big hole where the cooked plants are starting to cool off, and then you just kind of let that smoke fester in this hole, basically. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. And you roast it for often, you know, three to, to eight days, depending on what region you want, a little closer to five to eight typically. And um, and the, the whole thing, though, is that what people don't realize is that that's an aesthetic choice. So you have to remember that tequila used to be made by roasting it in this process. So you take these agave piñas and you have a choice then. It's like, do I throw them in whole? So if you throw them in whole, you can fit less in. But you also have to think about less surface area, so less smoke. Right. Mm. So if oh, you were okay. to chop your peanuts down smaller, like a lot of commercialized mezcal, like, you know, like Vita or El Silencio or something, they're leaning into the smoky flavor profile because it's the conception that Americans have of mezcal. They're leaning into it. So they chop it in smaller so it can fit more in the in the roasting pit, more yes. surface area and more smoke. More, so, yeah, more smoke. And then, of course, um, if you're in a region where your palinque, which is what they call the distilleries in Oaxaca, if around your palinque there's a ton of white oak trees versus um, mesquite trees, 
mesquite has a high high smoke content right and white oak does not so that's going to be another factor what kind of wood do you use how big is your roasting pit how small do you chop down your peanuts? It's controlled. So, is it expected that all mezcal is made in these underground pits, or can is there any sort of uh, acceptance for like an autoclave? Um, I only know of one um, one product that is exported that uses uh, that they actually don't use an autoclave. Well, I guess they probably do. It's probably an autoclave in conjunction with the diffuser, which is more uh, commercial processed, which is Zignum. That's the only brand I know that currently does that. Zignum? Zignum. Yeah. Ooh. That's the it's like it looks like the Budweiser factory when you're in Oaxaca. It's this giant building on the side of the freeway, you know. And I don't think I know that brand. I've never heard of that one. Yeah, you don't want it. You don't want <laughs> it. No, it's not good. <laughs> but, but that's kind of like a steel cooked um, version. Uh, you know, I mean it's just basically put in a, a diffuser which is kind of like a giant pressure cooker with yeah. hot water bath and um, and it's exposed to and some chemical processes. Crushers, right? They're crushing it. There's a lot of different ways that you can use a diffuser I've in seen conjunction. I've diffuser, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, that's the thing about diffusers is that there's a lot of versatile ways you can integrate it into your process. Some are pure evil and some are, I'm sure, in, in theory, uh, economic. Um, but, Got it. but either way, I'm not sure what Zignum does. I didn't really care, or care to dig a lot deeper. All I know is that they, it's, it's an inauthentic process designed for the masses, and uh, that's their choice. But um, it's something that you don't really find in Mescal. I'd say that there's... Other than Zignum, you're not going to find a mescal product uh, that doesn't roast subterranean at this time. Although I do know a couple brands that are roasting it, it or that have been, I've like tasted one or two that don't even come to mind that roasting in ovens like tequila, and they're calling it like a smokeless mescal. Got but, it, hmm. got it. But like I said. Sort of like an un, an un, the unsmoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a choice, but I I'd mean, say. I've had, I've had unpeated Ile. Yeah, you know, it exists. And, uh, uh, yeah. and actually, you were comparing it to scotch. Uh, another reason that is is because a lot of uh, mescal production in the artisanal category of mescal um, is actually distilled in a copper pot still exactly like scotch. So that's okay. so that's why you're actually going to yeah. get some of that quality as well. Yeah. Well, before we move on away from this one, like, what do we think of this? I mean, what are what are we getting here? Yeah. So the Criente, um, 40 percent. You know, very Americanized as we as we established. Yeah. Um, I'm at a B minus for this one only because it's 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 smooth, it's fine. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't have any really strong negative flavors coming out of it. It's very vegetal for me. I thought it had a little bit of that um, almost like I want to say artichoke coming out of it uh, on sure, the nose, sure. yeah, and a little bit of marshmallow cloudy. It felt a little sweet uh, or maybe artificially sweetened in some way, which I think yeah. they can get away with that, right? They can add sugar if they wanted to. Well, um, most, I don't really know. You say that a lot in tequila. Um, I don't know any mezcal that's currently doing that. A good way to test it is just rub it on the palm of your hand, and if it dries clean, there's no sugar. So. Got it. Yeah, so I, again, it did, it did have a sweet um, characteristic to it, mm-hmm. and there was a little citrus on the nose as well, but ultimately it wasn't like – profoundly amazing so i'd yeah. give it a b minus that's kind of the realm i'm in i might be a little slightly lower than that my only well, i'm i'm a little torn because on one hand i'm actually pleasantly surprised for an americanized mezcal uh i'm i there's a plenty of a nice kind of smooth smoke on the nose like it deck you know it didn't uh, lean away from that but as mm-hmm. soon as you really dig into the body it really falls off uh yeah. the, the, there's is yeah. It, you know, it's lower in proof and it really doesn't cling on there. So this is just something that's just going to have to be mixed ultimately. Are you at a C plus? Yeah. And probably it's between C plus and B minus. Yeah, it's not egregious. I mean, it's, there's nothing bad no, about no, no. it. It's just, yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's to me, it's like after drinking a lot of, you know, nice mezcal like this, the mouth feels completely vapid. Uh, you were saying sweetness, you know, to me, it's like agave has a often perceived sweetness because mm. it is something we normally associate with As sweetener. As is corn a lot of times, too. Corn, too, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's bourbon. It's sweeter. It's like, not always. Yeah, I mean, no. If it was made in Texas, that shit's going to be dry as hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, as I've found with my Texas bourbons. But anyways. So, I mean, this to me, it's like it has no mouthfeel. And the right. reason is, is not because of only water dilution, but uh, bleating. I'm sorry, uh because it's, you know, 40%. But um, mezcals, the, my favorite mezcals are usually, uh, which is totally unacceptable in lots of other spirit categories. A lot of the time they're uh, blended to proof, not by using the heart or with water, but using heads and tails, Ooh. which is why uh, most mezcal has that beautiful mouthfeel if you get really authentic product. And it's because these people do it masterfully, and that's why it coats your mouth. And this, to me, just leaves my mouth completely yeah, clean. And, and nothing, no nothing linger. Nothing yeah. yeah, which yeah. isn't bad, you know. And it's, it's for me, this has a very uh, gentle smoke, like you said. And... 
Um, I, you know, I could see this being a good introductory product for a lot of people. Um, but to me, you know, it's especially in a cocktail, I do want a little higher proof cause I want to actually sure, punch through yeah. some, oh, yeah. some flavors and, um, but you know, it's, it's everything serves a purpose. And I think, um, someone trying this and liking it is good for the mezcal community in general. Oh, but yeah. like I said, I, I wouldn't carry it at my bar because it doesn't meet my buying standards of authenticity. Uh, but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's got a nice flavor that I think if it was a higher proof would stand up a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it, it you know, falls a little flat for me just because of, of that. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, next up, we actually have the only non, uh, well, the actually the only colored spirit on the table. Yeah. Uh, this is an, it's an uh, With any color whatsoever. So the Los Amantes Añejo, two years on this one, I believe. Is that for, right? Yep. Oak barrels for a total of 18 months aged. American actually. and French oak barrels. Yes. Yep. There you go. So, I mean, how often do we find... Mezcal aged. So that I've heard conflicting things on because I've I've heard from some people. Um, one of my buddies is the Fortaleza, Fortaleza brand ambassador. Uh, he comes in all the time, and I particularly don't really enjoy uh, barrel aged mezcal. For me, it's you know whiskey gets a lot of its characteristic. I mean, all of its characteristics basically, except for the white whiskey characteristics, which not are not what whiskey's known for from the barrel. Oh, yeah. Whereas these plants, you know, take uh, like the Espadine, which is what we're drinking currently, can take up to typically 10 to 12 years to mature. Yeah. It's a very expressive plant, and I don't really see the purpose in hiding what makes this spirit special with something else. So, mm. a lot of people say whiskey ages in the barrel, but mezcal and tequila age in the ground. Yeah. It's kind of what, it, and not, you know, metaphorically, you know, by doing the process of making it and, and cooking it, but also the plants themselves, you know, why would you? cover up the flavor you've been harvesting and growing for seven, eight, 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah. I've heard of 14 years. Is that Yeah. I mean, the Tepestate that you were showing me before we started recording, actually, that, that mezcal is famous for its large age statement, which I've seen um, typically flo usually floats around the 25 year mark. Oh, um, shit. Yeah. So that's a 25 year rough agave. Um, Did I've they heard stop growing at a certain, like, are they just going to grow, grow, grow? Well, the whole thing about those agaves is that basically they shoot up what's called a quixote, which is uh, if you've ever seen those giant floral stalks coming out the yeah. top, oh, yeah. it's basically the plant's genitalia. So what it does is it shoots up all of its starches or sugars into the quixote and it attempts to reproduce. But um, once it reproduces, uh, it dies. So what happens is these mescaleros, they go out and when it starts to flower, they chop off the quixote and it will continue to mature sugars and become ripe uh, over the next few years. They neuter the plant. Temporarily, yeah, <laughs> temporarily, and that's actually an important part of sustainability: is letting you know, ex not not harvesting all the agave, letting maybe like one in ten actually flower, so you can save it for future generations. Because if you can imagine, thirty five years out, you're basically relying on your dad or your grandpa to plant those for you. You know, so it's you got to pay it forward. You got to make sure that there's some left for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. So like, uh, and you know, since we're drinking like you know barrel aged mezcal, I think, or you know, I think it's important to take note of where that came from, which is the fact of the matter is, is in tequila, you know, that wasn't always a thing. There was never bourbon barrels in Mexico before bourbon was introduced to Mexico. So, yeah. you know, it was just, you know, the Hispanic people came up to America. They said, buy tequila from us. And they said, we're not, what is that? Why is it clear? We're not drinking clear. We're drinking bourbon, you know, we're drinking whiskey. And, um, so they went, Oh shoot. Okay. So how do you guys do that? And they're like, well, we take these barrels and they go, can we buy those barrels from you? Can we put it in the <laughs> barrel? So I'm not saying it hasn't bred a beautiful culture. And I think there's some really well executed, uh, spirits like that in the world, uh, barrel aged tequilas, but um, it is once again, uh, something to cater as an introduction to Americans to get them excited about something. Sure. I think, uh, with the internet and people's open mindedness these days, I don't think we need that stuff anymore. And, uh, although I do enjoy some beautiful aged, uh, spirits, yeah, yeah. I'm, I I've had some extra añejos that I, I wouldn't trade for much else. I mean, I, there are some good yeah, ones out there. And there's oh, some yeah. extra oh, yeah. añejos that you wouldn't even peg as tequila though. Oh I yeah. I mean, I mean, they almost start to become something else. Yeah. They're so far removed and changed. But this this Los Amantes Añejo, um, which is funny because it says two on the bottle, but my notes here say uh, 18 months, so maybe they've rounded up. Um, but again, this has a really interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't smell. expect this <laughs> at all. Um, it's I don't even know where to go with this. It oh, is definitely sweeter, dusty um, on the nose. Yeah, I'm getting like a dust. Yeah, it's almost like kind of candy marshmallowy sweetness in yeah. in some areas and. Ah, uh, you know, the, the, I was expecting a different barrel to come through. I mean, two years in a barrel is a significant amount of time, so I'm expecting, 
a little bit of that wood flavor and it's that's not what i'm getting it's not necessarily bad it's just very different than i expected so the i think that comes to an interesting point which is what do you you're buying a used barrel most of the time you know yeah, so it says they lightly toast them again okay um which could be just to reignite some of the car the carbon flavor and get those mm. sugars back to the surface if they've sunken into the oak a little bit you bring that out by warming it up um i'm getting that sweetness you guys are getting but man it's uh I don't like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's 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 very very just so different than I expected. It tastes like dates. I'm getting like yeah. this chalky, dusty uh, thing I can't shake, mixed with sweetness, and it's not a balanced. I get a thing little I'm kind getting. of medicinal, syrupy, medicinal thing that it's I'm too not. much time in the barrel. I think. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. overaged. Yeah, it's it's just you know it's. I've had some really when I was down with Del Maguey, uh they had some they had a I don't remember what varietal it was but they had um they had a batch that they don't distribute they just had it there for for, for funsies and they had a I think it was a pappy barrel aged not in charred just stuck right in there and then they also had a I believe it was calvados aged oh nice uh, mescal and um those were the most enjoyable examples of the category I've had and you know, I Calvados feel like, is great. It's oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it was it was undeniably delicious and it was handled well, but um and that takes a lot for me to say because I'm I don't carry any of product those products at my bar, uh, yeah. age mescals. Um but yeah, people do it right sometimes and I believe that, you know, I I personally believe that if there's a village that's been doing that for as long as they can remember, who am I to tell them that it's not right? But it's not my cup of tea. Yeah. Well, I just feel like there's got to be a good version of barrel aged mezcal, right? You, you, you know, smoky and wood flavor should, mm -hmm. if combined properly, play into something really, really nice. Unfortunately, that for me, this is just isn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, why mess with it? Yeah. Why do that? It's a little so, sacrilegious. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that like, uh, which coming from you is means sacrilegious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right. I appreciate you touching you heard it. I had that same, uh, yeah. I had that same thought. Yeah. <laughs> I give the Amantes a. Uh, this one is actually a, this is a, a C, solid C minus. C for, I'm at C. Um, or sorry, yeah, like solid C. Yeah, it's just not really. I think it, this is going to fetch a higher price point being an Añejo, and I'm not sure you're you're doing your wallet justice by spending the extra money for that for that statement because. Yeah. Juice wise, I'm not sure I'm getting it. Yeah, um, I actually like the Criante better. Yeah, honestly, I would agree with him. Of yeah. the two, I would pick the Criante. Um, well, this next one, I'm really excited to get into because I feel like this is for a lot of people when they they are, are saying, "Hey, I want to get a good bottle of mezcal," but I, it needs to be something that I can find at my local store. A lot of people choose this one, the Vita, right? Yep. Um, so tell us a little bit about this one and, and where, you know, what's, what's the other aspect of Mezcal that you want to also get into? Cause we kind of talked a little bit about the cooking. We did talk about um, cooking. One oh, thing, fermentation. Yeah. So yeah. there's, I wanted to talk a little bit about fermentation and there's a couple unique as we, as we grab our glasses. Yeah. Yeah. And again, absolutely. this is the Del Maguey. It's this Vita. really classic green bottle. It's the the glass is green. The the label is mostly green. To it's me, like this always bottle. stands out. It's like that wine uh, bottle you see. Yeah. Now they make a lot of different stuff too. I mean, they've got what a dozen plus uh, bottles. Or, yeah, they or do a lot of limited releases. A lot well, of stuff yeah. that comes out, and these things can range from you know the forty to fifty dollar range up to several hundred, even thousand. Uh, I don't know anything up in the thousand dollar range, but, but usually but several hundred. I know there's like yeah. four hundred dollar bottles. Yeah, um, there's some there's some more limited releases that they put. Yeah, in, absolutely. And I'm sure you know a lot more about those because uh, I don't know anything <laughs> about them. Um, and we'll ask you about them. But one thing I wanted to cover with, since we have you here is fermentation. Yeah, uh, mezcal does some interesting things. At ferm they do interesting things. At every Across stage, board, at every absolutely. stage of making yeah. a spirit, um, but fermentation being a very important part. Uh, traditional would be wood or metal containers. They also have cement and leather containers in their process. Yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about those processes. So one of the things that to me makes tequila amazing is when I have a tequila that does open air fermentation, which means it's not inoculated with yeast. So it, they just basically 
the natural yeast from the air begin to ferment, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And a big aspect of that, which actually adds to it quite a bit, is something called the bagasse. And the bagasse is actually what it what it is, is the shredded agave fibers, right? So if you were to be doing an open air fermentation, you would have the shredded agave in there as it's fermenting, and it's kind of steeping like tea and adding that extra layer of flavor. Whereas if you're doing a more commercial product, you would have in this giant steel tanks, you're probably inoculating with some kind of wine or champagne yeast, yeah. and it's and it's kind of left to its own devices. So not to say it's bad, but you know that extra layer of flavor is uh, well. Usually, awesome. wild yeast has its own funk, you know, and 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 yeah. also wild yeast is unique to the area. If you yeah, are going it's proprietary. to proprietary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's you know it's this, it's a whole thing, but you know it depends on where you are. So there's um, concrete, which is uh, how they do a lot of uh, mescal, especially that can't be legally called mescal, but is in like the Jalisco region. Um, they've uh, I've done a lot. There's a lot that's done in wood uh, that's above ground, which is the most common that you'll find in. Yeah, I've uh, seen that one, which is great. Uh, they have subterranean. So when I was in Santa Catarina Minas, which is a mountainous region in Oaxaca, known for its very classical mescal um some of the original uh mescal they claim you know a lot of the, like thing a lot of trends common trends that you find there kind of originated from that region um that's uh above ground and then there's ones where you go to michoacan and it's wood but it's subterranean so built into the ground kind of like a cool little hot tubby kind of situation <laughs> and then uh the leather ones are actually really interesting because what they do is that uh, that that story is because in certain regions uh it was illegal right it was like moonshining to make mescal so what you would do is you would take these leather sacks um and you would how big are we talking like pretty big not like as big as you would not as big as the fermentation vats that you would normally find but i mean to put it in context the reason that they did this is so if the federales came up they would actually take their fermentation vats you would put it on a horse and you would ride off so that's what it is it's <laughs> oh, so it's like one it's like one hide it's not like a big gigantic they probably sewed multiple together but okay. it is yeah. but it got is it. it is mobile it's enough that someone needs uh, to be able to origin. carry it a horse can carry it someone's got to throw it on the back of a horse right but in origin so i'm assuming that as time has gone on and it is now legal to produce in that region that that has changed but originally yes that was the thought process yeah and a have you had any leather fermented uh mezcals and what are you looking for in taste profile that varies when you do leather versus a more traditional wood or even concrete or, or stainless steel or yeah, anything like that? Yeah, you know, I will say it's more of a nuance. Is uh, To a trained palate, you can definitely get it. Um, but, like, uh, there's this beautiful lineup called Cinco Sentidos, which is some of my favorite. Um, great curation from Oaxaca. Um, they own a bar called El Distillado. So if you're ever down there, you can go in there and just really explore their, their flavor profile or their, their lineup. Mm. Um but uh, yeah, so I have a couple skews from that, or one skew actually at the moment where they ferment in leather, and it's um, you know it's just kind of it piggybacks on the flavors that are present already in their process, so it just kind of reinforces this kind of earthiness, grittiness, you know, yeah, and it and it brings that out, which is really cool. Whereas if you're fermenting in some kind of like cedar wood, you're gonna get like almost like a palo santo we kind of florality that kind of piggybacks on that. But it is a nuance, um, but it's it's really cool just because it's, it's so interesting to see stylistically how these people do things so differently from one another and how it impacts their overall process and they, yeah. ca and they cater to that and they built around it. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's special nice. stuff though. It's really good. And it, none of the stuff we're drinking today is, is leather. No, 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 it's, no. it's very rare. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's because, I mean, doesn't it's gotta be expensive. Doesn't, doesn't too. sound economical. I mean, geez, it doesn't yeah. sound um, <laughs> knowing how expensive leather is. Functional. Yeah, it doesn't old... sound functional either in, right. in terms of like ease. You know, you'd be better off buying a barrel, popping the head off, and then fermenting in a, in a used barrel yeah. for God's sake. Yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff with mescal isn't really about practicality. You know, that's what I always remember. <laughs> you know, it's it's. I mean, and you know, actually, you know, everyone thinks that mescal isn't aged. It actually is. It's just a lot. Most people, or most of the master mescaleros that I know, they actually take mescal, and what they'll do is they'll put it in a glass demijohn or carbuy, like a glass container, and they put it in what's called the mescal crypt, which is a subterranean storage room, and they actually will let it mellow in there for six months to a year, sometimes more, just to round yeah. out those high alcohol esters and make it mm. so i mean the the mark of a really amazing mescalero is when you'll take they'll just drink they'll give you some of their puntas or their heads you know you're talking 76 percent alcohol it's mellowed out in glass all that you'll hand it to you and you're like that's fucking delicious that's amazing <laughs> yeah. you know you have no idea it's that high yeah. proof yeah and, wow. uh, and that that is a, a nuance of the trade that a lot that you won't find in in things like criante or vita because the fact of the matter is, is it's designed to be mixed, uh, and so it is a commercial product, you know, in right. in, in the sense. Yep. I yeah. just have to say that one a mezcal 
Crypt sounds really metal. Yeah. Oh yeah. And two, it's now on my list of like life goals because that's I, that sounds like something amazing that I have to I have to go into one of those once. I have a strong <laughs> feeling you're gonna need a special invite for that. You yeah. Get, you, that, that's not something not, you can. Yeah, I can't just get go buy tickets tour. or something. Not, no, you gotta not, know somebody who knows oh, somebody. That's to not get on TripAdvisor. <laughs> no. That shit's not on TripAdvisor. Right. <laughs> You'd be surprised though. The, the the mescaleros are surprisingly welcoming and and they'll. That's one of my favorite things ever is they take you down to their crypt and they'll take you down and then you'll just sample things directly out of these like basically bamboo shoots where they'll put their hand on the top like a giant straw, put it into a copita or cup, you know, and you'll just um, nice. You'll just yep. try that. You'll just sample. Yep. And it's I like a bamboo do thief. That. Yeah, bamboo thief. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I finished my Vita. Um, it's a little soapy on the forward of it. It's just got a bit of like. It's a little minty, spearminty thing happening. I wonder I if that's what that. you're kind of like yeah. picking yeah. up. Um, it is, it's not, it's over 40 proof. I think it's 42, uh, I think. 42. Yeah. yeah. So, but it's not, the body isn't there either. Really? Yeah, um, the nose is actually quite nice though. I it, actually, that's, I liked the, the nose. nose is great. I mean, it's got those nice, like well-rounded sweetness flavors with a, with a light smoke over all of it, a little bit of citrus. And then you kind of dig into it and you're like, uh, where did those go? So, yeah, I kind of agree. Yeah. The, the nose was a lot more enticing than the actual, yeah. um, mm-hmm body of it and when you get there isn't enough to chew on it It starts to fall flat i mean uh, for me a little bit especially as you as you on the second third sip exactly Mm -hmm. i mean the whole thing about delman gay is that they have some amazingly beautiful products i've been to many of their palinques and they have some you know there's not a ton of different what is a palinque so palinque is a distillery basically okay got it Uh, it's it's basically it's like a distillery but in someone's backyard essentially you know what i mean it's i want to go to one of those too at this point (laughs) at this point i'm going to remind everybody i know very little about mezcal this is an educational (laughs) yeah Yeah, i apologize for those listening that know all this yeah i mean if you do i'm impressed but I need to learn. <laughs> I mean, it's also it's also regional, so they would call it a Palenque in Oaxaca, and if you were to go to Michoacan, they would call it a Vinafra, basically a place where you make wine, but it's agave, uh-huh. agave wine that you distill. So, um, nice. I mean, so the thing is, is that like, okay, so like, there's a this is espadine, which 95 percent of the mezcal imported to the United States is made out of this one plant because it matures very quickly and it's easily cultivated, a lot like Blue Weber tequila, or Blue Weber agave and tequila. So uh, they have a, a Great, I'll call this. So they have a whole line where it's just different espadines, and each one is named after the region it's from. It's of a more appropriate proof. Um, for example, one Chichicapa. That's one of my, one of the introductory mezcals. I actually feel like they inter- they might have imported it before Vita, um, and that was uh, like in the classic specs for cocktails like the Oaxacan Old Fashioned. There's a half ounce of it in it because that was how you, they introduced it, right? It was like awesome. a half ounce to you know an ounce and a half of uh, tequila reposado in an old fashioned. That was kind of like teach the American public what it is. It's yep. expensive, so we can only put in half an ounce, blah, 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 blah. So Vita, the reason I call it a commercialized product is because, like, you know, I'll go on the Del Maguey tour. They don't take you to where Vita is made, and that's because Vita is, uh, you know, they it's basically you buy a bunch of different batches and you blend it for a consistent product. Mm. Uh, to me, mezcal is a snapshot of a time and a place. It's a story of a plant. It's a story of the place where it's made. It's the story of a family. This is not the story of a family. This is not the story of a plant. This is a a commercialized product that's blended for consistency. It's sold in Trader Joe's and there, you know, there's not a problem with that. And, you know, and it is important. And one of my favorite things actually on the Vita bottle that I think is the most important thing that Ron Cooper, who started Del Maguey did for the mezcal community was this was the first product that most people try. And if you see on the side of the bottle, it says, don't shoot sip. Right. And that's, big that's that's a that's getting off on the right foot you know that's that's this is what this is supposed to be this is the first time you're seeing this and even though it is of a price and it is of conception in the agave community that fell victim to things like jose cuervo telling you to like don't want to taste it chase, chase it with the lime chill it down just yep. freaking shoot it brother like this was like <laughs> don't don't shoot it sip it and um whether or not you like it that is a important foot to get off on you know yeah i think i think that context really we're telling a story here um and we're trying to uncover sort of the unknown about a category that most people do not know about me being uh, a person who prides themselves on spirits in general and loves and is staring right now at a wall of 700 bottles. It's still a category and a subject I know very little about. And Mm -hmm. as we dive into the story of this category, it's important to know the people and the brand and, and the, you know, uh, Mezcaleros and people, uh, have done for this industry and for this segment of it and getting into that and understanding, you know, McGay is the guys, uh, who first said, 
sip on your mezcal. That's yeah. important. Yeah. Well, exactly. to, to the to the non-Mexican public, let's put it that yeah, way. Because yeah. they knew it for a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and don't get me wrong. You'll see some people shooting some Del Maguey. And, you know, and actually, that's an important part, too, is, you know, even though this, I'd say, is probably the most common and you would associate for, like, mixing, I would say, you know, right? Right. Um, to put it in perspective, most well tequila at a lot of restaurants is going to float around, the you know, 12 Twelve dollars, ten dollars, often cheaper a liter, whereas this is uh, what most people would associate as uh, introductory mezcal. You're still going to be paying about as a wholesale account about you would be buying this as a bar for about twenty two dollars for a seven fifty, right. you know, and that's big. That's different. You know, it might have gone a little lower because it just got acquired by a beer, bigger beer portfolio, but that's how special these plants are, and that's how expensive they are, and that's and that's how it should yeah. be, you know what I mean? And yeah. that's the point, you know, and that's the whole point about this right now and all the activism that people are doing in the Mescal community is to not see it get down to that point, because then we're going to have things like Zygnum, you know, where it's made in this big commercialized process, and it's no longer the spirit it once was, you know, and people... Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole point, is you have to to understand it is to to pay for it and actually get what it what it's about. Yeah. Understanding what it's about and, and receiving that when you put money on the table to buy mm-hmm. something. Hopefully we can uh, through this tasting alone help <laughs> guide you towards the better ones. Um, taste profile wise as well. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, next next yeah. is the Bozal. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're on our fourth uh, our fourth bottle here. The Espadin. It's the uh, this Espadine. is uh, hands it's, down the coolest bottle on the table. Now, I yes, know, Max, that you said you're not a fan of this bottle from a practical oh. <laughs> standpoint. It's, um, it's a good brand. It's a very good it's brand. A cool, yeah. It's a very, very cool look. I mean, what is this made out of? Uh, I think is it's, it like ceramic? Yeah, some kind of ceramic. I mean, it, 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 it is, well, first of all, it's not glass. It's the only bottle on the table that's not glass. It's ceramic. It's this beautiful tan speckled color, um, almost as if wood was ceramic. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just really, really, really gorgeous. So, uh, yeah, t- uh, Seth, tell us a little bit about this bottle. Just quickly, it is a, uh, cultivated Espadine and it actually has wild agave barrel and Mexicano. Mm-hmm. Um, and also so, noted on the bottle too. Yeah. And actually this, the product we're actually is the beige or, or sort of tan colored bottle and it's called the Bozal Ensemble. And mm-hmm. so this is a strikingly beautiful bottle, as we were saying, um, I know there are black and blue and I believe even pink variations of this. They have quite a few. And yeah. there's a, there's more, I think that have come out. It's made by, uh, or it's at least imported by three badge spirits, which yep. is the guys that had done, um, Bib and Tucker. And they also did, um, Masterson's, which got sold a few years back. And they also have a Kirk and Sweeney rum. Hmm. And P- Pizote and, tequila, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Pizote tequila. Yeah. So they do an interesting company. Um, mm. I think they're actually part of Don Sebastiani and Sons uh, as the wine as the wine side of that uh, business, and so it's relatively crafty but still pretty big company overall. And you know the fact that they got into mezcal at all was mm-hmm. pretty fascinating when yeah. they did because this product's been out for yeah. several years. This is not a new product, and it's good quality. It really yeah, is. and um, it's also worth noting that this is the first mezcal on the table where we have passed that forty-five percent mark. We're yes. at 47 now. 47. 94 so, proof. So, yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. So, there's a couple things that typically I'll look at when I look at a bottle like this. I believe this one is in, uh, does it say artisanal on it? So, it says artisan. <laughs> I'm not sure if it says that specifically. I think this is an artisanal one. So, they do artisanal and they do ancestral. And artisanal means that you use modern technology to a degree. Uh, in conjunction with old technology to make the old process more efficient. Things like copper stills. Um, you can use a wood chipper if you want to, to shred your agave rather than using a tohono wheel, which is that big stone wheel that's pulled by a by donkey. A mule, yeah. yeah. Um, so they do both. So if you look at Bozal, sometimes there's a giant price leap, and that's because some of it's ancestral, which means only using technology that they would have used hundreds of years ago. So no modern anything. And one of the biggest things is that uh, ancestral is copper, whereas... Uh, I'm sorry, artisanal is copper, ancestral is done in a clay pot still. And uh, that gets very expensive because not only is it going to impart those flavors, it's porous. So there's a larger angel share, uh, about 40% actually. So you're about to get 40% less wow. yield out of a batch. Shit. 
Yeah. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it Big certainly time. is. And so, uh, you know, there's a reason why these products get very expensive. And also an, another thing to point out about this, which is, is, is good, is it's an ensemble, right? So an ensemble to an American is a Latin-rooted word, obviously, that we all recognize, which means a blend. So you know, Earlier when I said ensemble. What's up? Earlier yeah, when yeah. I said ensemble, ensemble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like it, it, it translates it to you, right? Yep. So yeah. the point and the thing is, is that is also an Americanized term. So if you're in Oaxaca, uh, ensemble is when you take different batches and you blend them. So I distilled this, I distilled that, I distilled this. Now we're going to blend them all together and make an ensemble. Uh, if you were to take all the different plants and do what's called a field blend, which is whatever you're making mezcal, whatever plants are ready, you throw into the roasting pit all together, you distill them all together and make a uniform product. That is called a mezcla. And that uh, a mezcla is very similar to mezcal. So when making the transition from Mexico to the United States, they decided that it was too confusing because it basically looked like a dyslexic version of mezcal. And you came up with this uniform term that is undifferentiated called ensemble uh so which i like i like that actually um and this is by far of the past four the most complex yes immediately you're starting to get stepped into a whole different realm yeah this is the mezcal that i like um this is the kind of thing i'm looking for when i'm drinking or trying mezcal um that higher proof is is bringing out a ton more flavor you're getting a lot less of the the watered down sort of uh lackluster flavors we were getting on the some of the previous ones yeah coats your palate really um delivers and lingers and it actually sits there for a second or two Mm -hmm. which the other ones really were falling flat and what's interesting about this to me is as we've kind of gone towards closer to the more traditional way of making things i feel like it's gotten less smoky this yep. is the there's the there, this is the least amount of if you want to just quantify that overall as smoke, this is the least smoky to me, and and instead you're bringing in a wide variety of other citrusy vegetal, um, and certainly as you talked about the mouthfeel is vastly improved. Um, why do you think that is, Max? Why is it a uh, lower smoke? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like I said, it's it's an unfortunate byproduct of the first brands that people tried. People tried Vita and they went, oh, it's smoky. And rather than going, not all mezcal is smoky and educating people for the greater longevity of other products, people just went, Americans like it, it's selling, and they think it's smoky, let's lean into that. So you're all, yep. of, a, so all of a sudden you're having these brands that are up in the smoke. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, and then also keep in mind, like I said, the smaller you chop down these agaves into the roast, the more you can fit in and the more smoky it becomes. So it's kind of a win-win for these people. You know, it's, it's, uh, you get more product. People are looking for that. It's iconic. And, um, as the more you get into it, you'll, you want to taste the plant. You don't always want to taste the process. And, you know, you have to think about the smokiness as a byproduct of the process, not the process itself. I almost get like a pineapple from this and a, a tropical element at the end which it's I so like. interesting yeah, because absolutely. i like get ripe pineapple, that too like really yep. yeah. i almost get those tropical fruits as if they were coated in like a cayenne spice like a cooked pineapple almost in a way yeah has, yeah caramelized or something because it's not smoky but there's a spice to it and sure. it's a much more layered spice as if it was you know like speaking of an ensemble or an ensemble um you know it it, it was it, it's as if there's chipotle serrano and jalapeno in there all kind of playing together you know yeah i mean what's kind of funny is that the pineapple and, and baking spice flavors that you're referring to uh it's pretty cool because there's actually a native drink called tapache um or tapache con piña in mexico where they t- actually take these pineapples uh and and more specifically they use the skins with different spices and they put it in with some water and piloncillo and they let it ferment into a lightly alcoholic beverage so you're picking out some very mexican flavors um in a product that is basically unrelated you know yeah no i very much like it this is it this is an easy b plus for me um i'm not sure if it if it quite jumps anything above that but it is clearly in a very different league than everything we've tasted up to this point yep. and and it gets me it gets me much more excited because i do feel like i'm getting closer to the roots of what and when you talk about these things of connecting with the plant and connecting with the history i feel like i get that much much more from this liquid than i have 
anything else on the table so yeah. far. It's showcasing the process. You would know? you would you go as far as to say that if this had been the product that hit the market first, that we'd have a totally different landscape of what Mezcal might be? Yeah, I mean, we definitely would. But honestly, I think also we would have a much less wide audience. You know, it's as much as I don't particularly enjoy some other forms of mezcal i think that these big flavors are we've we've had the, the pleasure of working up to this throughout this tasting our palates yep. are well adjusted right. you know but if uh, this is a mezcal that if you gave to somebody that's never tried it before chances are that you might you they know might they might push back yeah yeah um but i'm it, with you though cam i think uh b plus is kind of where i'm at maybe maybe even a minus maybe okay, even fair it's, enough i'm yeah, at like an 80 uh, 89 like right i, a, a I nice would drink B+. this anytime you poured it for me and if i saw it on the menu i would have no hesitation to order it um and recommend it as well so yeah. I, yeah, and highly i would just recommend, recommend it. it on somebody's home bar just because i you know i for hate decor. To, 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 <laughs> to labor this to death but oh my gosh this is going to be a bottle that just gets talked about and it's lovely in your hands mm-hmm. too. It's because it's it's a nice it is gift. ceramic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's really really nice. Yeah, and they yeah. they actually do uh, their higher end stuff. Their ancestral lineup uh, is actually really spectacular as well, and actually a little bit more modestly priced than um, a lot of other brands for for the an- ancestral um, mezcals and yeah. and or tequilas, mm-hmm. which I think we're about to, good transition actually. Yeah, yeah. Actually, because <laughs> this um, one just says ancestral, just every the boom I, right on the front. I have no uh, so now we're getting into the stuff max. We're getting into Max's to, crypt. This is yeah. a, this is a trip to Max's crypt. Yes. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what are we What are we drinking here? What's well, going on? I kind of ho- I, I kind of tricked you guys a little bit because we we're actually about to drink a tequila. Um, this is, uh, but the whole thing is that you know a lot of people say that all all tequila is mezcal, not all mezcal is tequila. You know, yep. so this the reason this is tequila. It's We've been bamboozled. You, I bamboozled. You. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is actually made out of Blue Weber, uh, which is what tequila needs to be made out of, and it's made in uh, Jalisco. So this is by definition tequila. Uh, what this is unusual is this is from a uh, brand called Sambre Valles, which is curated by, um, in my opinion, the, the king of of uh, ethical agave. You know. Um, practices in my opinion just preaching it and and living it uh david suro who's an amazing guy uh so this is a uh ancestral tequila and I, to, to my knowledge it's the only one really on the market um so what that means is that this is tequila made like mezcal so uh basically david he went to this distillery called cascoin which is a really beautiful tequila distillery that just started importing to the united states in the lowlands of tequila uh it was just one of his favorite distilleries in the 60s so when he started his own tequila line he logically approached them to produce his juice so what this is, is he actually brought um, from the Don Mateo family, uh, the distiller from, from there, from the, from the Palenque, or Vinafra, um, and he brought them and he took it to the tequila distillery and he said, teach them how to make mezcal. So what this is, is this is whole pina, so they don't break it down, so low smoke, so really low surface content. Yeah, none on the nose. If you just are in it immediately, none. Yeah, I mean, and that's what makes this special is it shows the control and the restraint. Um, this is batch two, so each batch is getting, in my opinion, a little better, which I really love because they're getting used to the technology. But this is roasted underground. Um, it is tequila, but it's done like mezcal, and it's distilled in a uh, Filipino hybrid still. Because in Oaxaca, you got the Arabic stills were the kind of the more modern ones that got introduced. This is a Filipino still, which so it's a hybrid of wood, brick, and a copper coil. Now, did we ask, did you already say about the Tejon? Uh, this is Tahona. This is Tohona. actually a robotic Tahona, so it's got a wheel, but it's got a robotic donkey that that pulls it <laughs> around. Yeah, I hope it's shit. When you in my mind, oh. I think of it literally a robotic donkey. Yeah, I yeah. Hope it's like that. But I know it's, it's, it's not. It's just a but. gear, right? Although you know what, I actually it is a gear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, gear, well, it's basically yeah. it's a machine with like a wheel. But I, uh, I basically I misspoke actually because this is not crushed with the Tahona. This is uh, crushed in the fashion that you would find in regions like Santa Catarina Minas, which is uh, with these giant wooden clubs. So they actually stick it in a little pit in the ground after it's roasted, uh, and they actually smash it by hand, and it's a very labor-intensive oh, process. That's awesome! Yeah, it's like a gigantic Seth, why don't you grab yeah. grab that exactly. bottle because what's really fascinating about this to me is how much information they put about each aspect of the process yep. yeah. on the bottle. It's absolutely fascinating. Not only are they talking about what happens at each step of the process, but they're actually naming names as to who is, uh, you know. Uh, making that step you know whether it be whether it be the actual kind of roasting or the fermentation or the distillation and they have photos of the people too which i just i love that i love that i think you have to have that i think if you're gonna probably charge a substantial amount more 
and people don't know what ancestral is, I love that they're almost spelling it out for you in a way. It's like, hey, don't mistake this for a white tequila. This is not, you know, even even uh, a fancy Blanco might run, you know, 40, 50, 60 bucks. This guy, I assume, is in that price range or higher? It's higher, yeah, like most definitely. A couple hundred or where, uh, where are we at? You'd probably this? buy this wholesale for... 130 something like that got it yeah as, as a, at retail? a commercial uh, yeah no no i'm at retail actually. oh at retail yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. probably yeah. like somewhere so around 150 if you see a white spirit for 130 you know i think that extra information is not nice i think it's required Re- yeah i think it's it needs to be i mean be... It, it literally says 113 hours in the pit oven yeah i mean it's telling you down to the hour how long this is roasted because otherwise just, I, this is so fascinating they're You're really giving, giving the american consumer way too much credit to not spell it out for them um i think you know these guys know what they're doing clearly yeah. by doing that in yeah the branding of it i mean david is all about full transparency and that's actually an interesting point because a lot of as the mezcal scene has evolved uh a lot of mezcal nerds actually don't like the Delma Gay line anymore because they don't give credit to the distillers on it. And the reason that is actually is because um, when they first started and, and as time has went on, they were afraid that people were going to poach their distillers, right? So they didn't put the name of the people on it. Uh, oh, interesting. Yes. I mean, can see how I suppose that would backfire, but it's kind of a sad... <laughs> well, they initially did, but as the brand grew, they decided to stop. Yeah. So... Um, that's the whole thing, you know, because I, I go down there. I know these people. It's not a secret, but, you know, at the same time, it's not something that's celebrated on the bottle like it is with here. And that's one of my favorite things about David, who runs this spirit book, wow. is that, I mean, this is tequila. This is, this is, this is unbelievable. Is, I, this I don't even know where to begin on this. Maybe one of the best clear spirits I've had in a long time. This, is, well, this might be maybe. one of the best spirits, period, I've had in a long <laughs> time. I'm, awesome. I'm absolutely blown away. What is interesting is, is that the lack of... The, the generalized smoke that you might not get on the nose, I actually do think it's really nicely rounded in the body. I get it in the body. Yeah. Um, among just a myriad of other flavors, I mean, there's some really, really lovely, sweet, uh, you know, again, those kind of tropical fruit notes. I think this is a much earthier, yeah. you know, spirit than the last one we had. So instead, we're really playing with like deep wood, even just like, just like smelling, you know, rich earth i mean it, it is it yeah. is uh it is fa- absolutely fantastic soil and, and and like uh caramelized sugars almost like yeah. that that kind of um dessert like sugar uh that is you can almost bite into it it's crunchy in there it yeah. has like that thin sort of uh um texture to it, 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 it if i'm visualizing a food here uh it is robust though Ugh, i mean it yes. really yeah. gets all up into all the little cracks and crevices in your mouth it really coats nicely and my god i mean this thing's gonna last i i, I would I, my my wife is gonna notice i was i was drinking when i get home like this is uh <laughs> this is that kind of a, yeah. of a spirit and it's chewy man I mean, you can really bite into this thing it's really awesome um yeah. And I love when you get that on a clear spirit that didn't have that barrel aging. A lot of times you get some of those qualities and characteristics from something that has been living in uh, an organic, you know, barrel um, and breathing in and out and contracting and expanding, you know, over, over seasons and years and hot years and cold years and dry years and moist years or humid. But when you get that with the clear spirit, it's unbelievable. You're just kind of confused for a second. You go, "Shit, wait." Yeah, yeah. No barrel at play. Where is this complexity derived from? And it's the plan. you know, the picture is it's the that's the that's the beauty of I think what some of these you know more undiscovered processes and spirits uh, have to offer. Yeah, I mean, and and this was a very controversial product because actually the tequila community was pretty outraged when David came out with this product out of fear because the whole thing is like, what are you doing? If this catches on, we're all screwed. This is an expensive process. You know, the only other Blanco tequila really on the market that has this flavor pro or that this price point is Costa Dragones Hoven, which is complete Ugh. chemical garbage, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, and this, this is abrasive. It's high proof. It's, and when I say abrasive, I mean abrasive to the common palate, you know, to the Costa Dragones drinker. This is, uh, it tells a story. And the whole thing is that not all stories are pretty, but, you know, this is expressive. It's beautiful, in yeah. my opinion. It's, 
it's everything. And uh, last time I was down there with, uh, I got to actually uh, be a part of the roast, which is really fun for a batch of this. And I tried, so we're on lot two, which is what we're trying right now. Lot six is what they're on in Mexico. And trust me, it's like now that they've gotten the process down a bit more, like this is the tip of the iceberg. It just gets, wow. it's all uphill from here. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a plus. A, yeah, a plus. it's yeah. it's it's uh, unlike <laughs> anything. I mean, this is forget everything that's just on the table. I want to just pick this bottle up and go uh, of your 750 spirits on the table. I'll go up against any one of those. I mean, it's I think fantastic. this is absolutely exceptional, um, you know, worth every penny that you might pay for this. Uh I, I'm just blown away. Yeah. That's, uh, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> it's a special product. And it, what's nice is that this is the perfect, to me, it's the perfect, it's not a, I don't want to call it a good selling tool because it's not as expensive, but for somebody that is a big tequila drinker that says they don't like mezcal or vice versa, this is just the perfect little segue. It's like, right. it's like, oh, you don't like tequila? Try this. It oh, reminds yeah. me of the first time <laughs> yeah. I had, you know, real palatable cast strength whiskey. But yeah, no, so we've got a cup. We've got two more. Now this this one with the green label you say has so much to talk about and so much story behind this. Yeah. yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what what is this product? The Sorry. The Malbien. Wait, but really quickly, what was the name of that last one? Uh, that was Siembre Valles Ancestral. I feel like we didn't say that before. It, uh, Siembra, Siembra Valles. Valles. So, so he has a quite, uh, there's a quite a few. So Siembra is a whole lineup. Siembra Azul is the Highlands uh, mm -hmm. tequila, which they're making less of these days because the, the Siembra Valles, which is the Valleys tequila, not Lowlands. I don't say Lowlands because the Lowlands of tequila are not Lowlands. They're Valleys contextually and, and they're okay. Lowlands within context of the Highlands, but they are not Lowlands. They are, right. they, they are they're not. They're just lower than the other yeah, parts. Yeah, that's an American <laughs> thing. They're made in the Valleys. Um, which is the original tequila growing region. Uh, actually, Blue Weber Agave didn't grow in the mountains until they took it up there to see how it fared. And obviously, the higher altitude did well for it because that's become the more popular side of the category. But this is the original tequila valley. You got to think in the valley, there's uh, the mountains are all volcanoes. So you're going to find volcanic soil down there. So a lot more minerality, a lot more expressive, uh, you know, ex eccentricities, whereas up top, it's more of a native soil. So sure. Um, he also does this one brand called Simbra Matal. And what that is, is it's actually kind of like an incubator for mezcal. So what he does is he finds a family that he really likes. That's Simbra Matal. Like most recently it was Don, con Don Mateo. So Don Mateo family. And, uh, is that he, the one you have down there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Got it, got so it. what he does is he actually will sell it under his label until they get enough of a following to where he then bottles it as their own label and a new producer will now step in as Sam Brimenthal. So it's it's an incubator, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. And so this next one we're trying, the green label is... The Malbien. 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 So that just means bad good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, and that's like an old saying. Um, Ooh, smell that. It's just that. That, that mezcal is, is that bad good. It's it's Ooh. like, there's no... It's basically the... It's the, <laughs> the saying is, there's no good time... There's no bad time for good mezcal basically it's it, that's kind of the it's like there there's no it's i like it there's no bad, bad time for good mezcal yeah i mean it's, there's all sorts of sayings i'm sure I'm there totally, you go I name like of the that. episode yeah no bad time yeah no I'll, bad time no for, bad good time for good mezcal well it's just like it's that bad it's like there's no i'm trying to remember what it is there's it's a really great little saying there's is it all, better than that because that's pretty good it, i'm gonna it, go with that it, if that's i if, feel like it is <laughs> i'm totally blanking out because we've had there's we've had some nice mezcal right now totally guys there's totally uh um, uh, now I'm noticing this. This is not clear. This has got almost a milky, almost like uh, yes, very uh, astute. And you have that. Uh, what's the not June Mai, but the other kind of uh, sake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, the, uh, the unfiltered sake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what's the name of it? I'm trying um, to. Um, it is. Uh, it's not Jumai Taginjo. No, it's, that's the clear uh, one. It's yeah, yeah, the yeah. Other one. It's um, uh, damn. I totally know this. Um, Nigori? No. No, it is Nigori. You're, Nigori? you're correct. Yes, yeah, Nigori. Nigori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this has that Nigori sort of, I, I don't want to call it a milkiness, but mm. it has, it's it's not, it's still translucent, but it's not uh, crystal clear either. And that's a first on the table. Definitely would leave a residue on a glass. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm actually shocked you noticed. You're, yeah. That is a rare observation. <laughs> so we, 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 color, kinda, we do color this smell, every now and then. Color, smell, no. Smell. Yeah. And I'd love to know, I mean, this bottle looks like literally someone took some duct tape and wrote it on here. Yeah, What's yeah, yeah. the deal here? Well, so the guys that actually import Malbien are named Ben and Anthony, and they're based here in Los Angeles. And they import some of my favorite mezcal spirits that we currently oh, have. Ben and Anthony. Yeah, those yeah. guys. Those guys. Yeah. Uh, they're great. They're really fun. Um, and they literally 
uh, they also import La Locura, which is one of my absolute favorite mezcal lines. Um, and but Malbien is really cool because they do a well mezcal, which is my personal favorite well mezcal if you can afford it, which is great. It's you know it's 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 you know you get what you pay for, which is quality. Uh, this is an interesting one. So, oh my god! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, this isn't. It's it's an intense. That is funk city. Yes, sir. Holy so, crap! So there's a lot of. Uh, things to notice about this. <laughs> you made the face uh, Yeah, you too. got a good face. Uh, we don't have a video on us this time, but there's I some know. faces. Wow. That wow. is like sharp. Not in a bad way, but like it's just, whoa. It's whole, expressive. Like, it's whoa. weird. <laughs> expressive. Yeah, I like yeah. that. So yes. this kind of hits you sharp in the front, almost like a, like a tartness, and then it kind of divulged into a sweetness and then ended on a smokiness, and it did all of that rather quickly it yeah. really kind of it's like a one of those little like dips after the big dip on a roller coaster like am i up am i down where am i going <laughs> so there's there's so there's a lot of things to talk about here <laughs> yes, so sir, uh yeah. so first off the label that you're referring to it's it's actually a joke about the plastic water bottles that you would bring back with some tape on it writing what it is and that's actually what this is it's actually printed on tape with handwriting of what's in it put on there you can actually pull off the pieces of tape it's yeah actually... i kind of pulled at it but since it's your bottle i didn't go too far because oh, no, i was like i don't want to think i'm an asshole <laughs> let me see that thing <laughs> yeah yeah like, I guess but it's, it's pretty great so all the information is on the back you know it's uh, distilled in copper but one of the most interesting things about this is habali so habali is the name of the agave uh habali as as seth noticed um this is a little cloudy and uh so all tequila and all mezcal is always distilled twice that's just a nature of the product um there's some exceptions to that rule, of course. Uh, this being one of them, typically. Uh, this one is not, though. <laughs> I know that's confusing, but <laughs> Hopoli is a wild agave. Um, I believe it takes about 12 to 15 years to mature. Uh, can't be cultivated. And it's very rare to be found made in mescal. And the reason is, is because it actually contains a component that's commonly found in soap, which is why you're looking at that uh, color, you know, that o opacity, right? So what happens is most people don't like to make it because when you're distilling it and you're fermenting it, it literally will foam over. It's incredibly hard to work really? with. So it takes a really skilled mescalero that's used to working with this kind of agave in order to make it. And particularly, they distilled habali typically three times. And that the reason why they do that, as in the exception to the two, two times rule, is because of the opacity of the spirit. So this guy is a, a, a skilled um, distiller, so that's why it is of a clearly, uh, you know, a fairly clear realm. Um, but that's why. So it's it's really hard to deal with, um, to work with. Uh, Habali is also really fun, just because Habali uh, is like boar. It's like a boar tusk, uh, basically, which is uh, what they named it after, because the pancus or the the spines of the agave plant actually resembled boar's tusk, so they named it Habali, which is why it's kind of fun. It stands out for me. Now I'm noticing it got kind of the bottle looks pretty clear, but it gets a little cloudier once it's poured. Is that part of the effect of it, or is it? It's basically the chemicals in essential oil, right? I mean, it's you're aerating uh, right. it and well, it's how, activating movement. it. Yeah, yeah. So it's and another thing to notice about this bottle of mescal is that there's a word missing from the bottle, which is mescal. You don't, right. <laughs> you, you, you don't see it anywhere. And this is by, mescal by definition. Um, it's fa fantastic. Uh, it's you know it's open fermented. It's roasted. Uh, they bring Bring it to proof with heads and tails, which we've talked about, which would not be great in, in bourbon uh, by, by definition, you know, and things like that. So um, what, you, what you have is that basically this, not this producer, but Malbien has done a great job of taking some established producers that normally I would buy um, through other lineups from a much higher price point. I'm talking wholesale, 160 bucks, 130 bucks, wholesale. So you, as a consumer, you're talking 250, some things like that. And what they did is they paid them more at least uh, to my understanding. And uh, by not putting mescal in their bottle, they've avoided about 120, 130% taxation hike. And Holy with, shit. Yeah. So basically, all of a sudden, you're looking at a bottle that would normally cost you 260 and because they don't put mescal in the bottle, it's now, you can buy it as a consumer for about 100 bucks, which is wow. which is great. And uh, and the whole thing is that they do have one that says mescal, but that's their well mescal. That's their mixing espadine. And that branding is so strong that they no longer need to put mescal on the rest of their Mon Boutique lineup so they can bring it to you at a more affordable price, which is why I think this is one of genius. the... I mean, it's actually really genius. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. making uh, one really good affordable bourbon and then doing the rest as American whiskey, but no one freaking reads Cares. the label. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they know the brand. If it has a strong brand name. Um, I, I've never, clever, I've, clever. Yeah. I, 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 I am almost without the words to describe this yeah. because I, I almost want to say it's like passion fruit meets cactus. 
or sure. something. I, I like mean, the cactus. It's just, I really like that it's cactus. It's just, it's, I've literally never had anything like this. I always get, uh, just as a childhood memory that drums up in my brain when I try this, is cold string cheese. Like, and maybe that's because ah. of the texture, but Similar it's, to cactus. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, here's where I'm at. I'm at coconut. Oh, sure. I'm actually okay, getting, okay. like, that, that coconut water um, sort of body to it. It... But again, there is a sharpness at the front. There's a smoke on the end. There is a little coconut sweetness. Um, You're right. I'm to- I I understand. I the get coconut the coconut, too. coconut and uh, I I wonder if the if it, when you say like a, you compare it to cheese, I, it is it. There's a funk to it too. Yeah, it's malolactic fermentation. Yeah, it it actually is lactic fermentation. You know what I mean? It's it's you're getting. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, this is. Uh, I don't know how much I'm, of it I could drink. I know. I'm like, not sure if I can ongoing. rush out and uh, recommend it to somebody immediately. Sure. But yeah, for yeah. somebody with a palate that is quite wide ranging and is looking for something different, I would. I, I it's, it's quite good. I think it's, it's the just most so interesting out of the on the box, table. You know. Yeah, and, that, and that's the reason I kind of brought that one for you guys. I mean, they have a tepestate, the same as the one that you liked, uh, Seth, that we were talking about yeah, earlier. That one, yeah. So they have a tepestate that's absolutely beautiful. I can guarantee you it's cheaper than every single one on the market. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just this beautiful representation of, of the category. This one I wanted to bring in just because it is an oddball. It's unusual. Uh, Anthony, the, one of the importers, says he normally doesn't like hobbly, and that's why he brought in this one is because he tried hobbly. it. And he goes, he goes, I'm bringing that one in because it's it's the it's the odd man out for me. It's the defier of, of my distaste for this agave <laughs> varietal. So lastly. Uh, the mezonte. Mezonte. Uh, yeah. Mezonte. Now, Max, you were really excited about this one when you yeah, brought it out. Yeah, I totally am. Where, uh, where are we at with this, and why, why is this one? Um... Take us to Michoacan. Yeah, so this is from Michoacan. It's not from Oaxaca, uh, which is important because a lot of the a lot of the mezcal that you're going to find here is in America is from Oaxaca because that's kind of known as the motherland of mezcal. But it can be made in all sorts of regions, uh, tons, actually. So uh, in Michoacan, typically, it's going to be a little on the fruitier side. For example, if you were in Oaxaca and you order a mezcal, they'll give it to you with some cricket salt and some orange on the side. If you're in Michoacan... Cricket salt? Yeah, dried crickets and salt okay. on top of okay. orange. Yeah, yeah, or, or agave <laughs> worms. I'm okay with that. I just I wanted to clarify. Yes, all the champoline. Um, so basically, uh, what you're what you're looking at now is uh, this is from a gentleman by the name of Jorge Perez. Uh, Mazonte, I call a historical preservation line. So they're based out of Guadalajara. This guy, great name, uh, guy named as just like the sherry named Pedro Jimenez. Um, actually curates this. So he goes, he finds these kind of pre-Hispanic spirits, super, super interesting. He preserves them by buying less than half, and then he pays the person more than their asking price. And uh, so I believe this is like a 180 liter batch. It's very teeny. Um, so you're looking at maybe 90 liters that... That's leave. less than a barrel. Yeah, I mean, it's teeny. You know, yeah, it's, 200, 200 liter barrel is like American. <laughs> yeah. 53 gallon barrel. Yep. Um, is two two or two twenty five uh, liters, so that's not even a barrel worth. It's it, pretty insane. So I mean, I get very little of this. Um, I mean, I, I I know the guys that make it, and I I've been there personally. I actually have a photo of the gentleman holding his first barrel. And this can you buy this anywhere in America? Yeah, you could get it at K and L Wine actually here. Yeah, oh, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave, uh, the spirit creator there, is a big fan as well. I was actually down there with him. Um, so you got some great stuff, and the whole thing is that, um. This Jorge Perez, so basically he is uh, in this village in northern Michoacan, and he only makes alto. And alto is a kind of agave that's the biggest agave I've actually seen made into distillate. And uh, not only on top of that, but it also has the lowest sugar content by part out of any agave that I've seen made into distillate. So it's, so it's this giant plant with incredibly low yield, right? But the, but the percentage is quite high. Yes. 49%, yeah, yeah. I believe. Yeah, exactly. So it's 49% alcohol. Um, it's up there. But, I mean, it's so cool. I mean, this guy's a rock star. So basically, he makes this uh, this giant plant. And if you were in a Michoacan, they'll have Jorge Perez or um, Mezcalante is the name of his, his line there. And it's you'll go and they'll have uh, alto con clavo, like you know, with like clove, and they'll have it with like banana and with orange peel. That's added to it, actually added. To he it, macerates or? it, so he Got actually it. will hang it in there. And actually, I actually have some uh, his pachugas that he's done, which are typically with fruits and nuts of the season, and actually an animal that's hung in the still. He does his with. I've had it done Did with. You say an animal that's hung in the still. Yeah. So you kind of glazed over <laughs> that. Yeah. You, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, he he is I'll, the metal uh, god uh, over hey, here. Come on. Yeah. So <laughs> once you burn the Bible, I mean, you can't really get oh, hung man. up on dead animals right. in the still. <laughs> Sorry. Animal in the still. What animal? So, okay. Well, <laughs> let's, let's start now there. Why? We're going to have to take a step back here. So, basically, a pachuga. Pig, a cow, yeah. a goat. What are we talking so, about? Well, so, typically, a pachuga is the only style of mezcal that's distilled three times. And what they okay. typically do is they, it's, uh, they, it has a reputation because pachuga means breast. And a lot of the time, it is a chicken or turkey breast that's hung in the top of the still. It's a piece of the animal. It's like a piece of meat. So, yes. But that also is basically a generality. So you can't take that generalization and apply it to all pachugas. So pachugas are exactly what I keep describing my skull as, which is a snapshot of a time and a place. So typically, the matriarch of the family, the abuela, the mo- whoever, what she'll do is she'll gather fruits and nuts of the season. Sometimes they'll make it into a syrup. Sometimes they'll just have it as is. They put it into the distillation, into it. And then what they'll do is often, more often than not, is hang this piece of meat in the top of the still. The evaporation kind of turns it into jerky. The drippings go back into the distillate. And you're, do they you're, eat the meat after? You can. I've had uh, Madre and Torrance actually has done some dishes with that. Wow. They've taken back. Um, so people think it always means chicken because breast, right? It actually doesn't mean that. It means heart. And it's the heart of the mescalero because it's a snapshot of where he lives. It's the snapshot of where he makes these things. So typically it's chicken. A lot of time it's turkey. Uh, the other bottle I brought is actually iguana, deer, rabbit, oh and turkey. <laughs> um, but this guy we is... We got to try that. Oh, it's yeah, good. No kidding, <laughs> I got to try it. I want the iguana one. So this guy has done it. Um, I think it was all of those together, right? Yeah, all oh, of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. my bad. It's okay, all. It's an great. ensemble. It's an <laughs> ensemble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a zoo. It's a menagerie. Yeah. Um, so this guy in particular actually brought back two very unusual ones. Um, one with a coyote. Um, that he put oh. in the top of the still, a viscerated coyote, and one with a rattlesnake. Um, Why do I think it's going to be like some roadkill? He's like, wait, we can use that. Grabs yeah. the coyote off the road, well, this puts guy, it in the pachuga. Yeah. Well, this guy's such a rock star, and they always say, uh, so Jorge Perez, they always say, like, if you're an animal, you got to watch out for por- Jorge, because if you wander onto his property, you're going to wind up in a pachuga. That's just the nature of things. <laughs> um, and they, oh, my favorite. Literally. We don't have to talk about the extension of where that might go as a <laughs> yeah. human being if yeah, you right. wander onto his <laughs> cannibalistic pachuga um so also the thing is uh my favorite thing about him uh well a first off most of the time it's just hung in the still i jorge also will add the animal back into the glass aging vessel for extended period of time kind of chinese medicine style which i've had which is very interesting i've never seen that outside of him but my favorite thing about him is that he has this uh rumor that he plays soccer with rocks everyone's always like jorge yeah he's a badass he plays soccer with rocks and you're just like Totally. Ow. Yeah, you're like totally <laughs> badass. And um, he so act- does he or not? I haven't seen him do Legend it. But, has it. <laughs> Legend, but he's has a rock star, it. and he um, he uh, so he, a couple more things about him, and and uh, that makes this special. First off, agave spirits um, predecessor is called pulque, and apparently the Aztecs had a agave spirit on a hill. It got struck by lightning, and when they get to go examine it, there was this bubbling alcoholic liquid which is the predecessor to our agave spirit. It's called pulque, which is kind of like a thick agave beer. Um, what he does is he also makes pulque, but what he does is he actually takes the pulque and he adds it into the fermentation as a starter. Pulque has a very unusual flavor that kind of comes across in here a little bit, in my opinion. Um, and not only that, but apparently when he was t- deciding whether or not he wanted to take over his family's line and become a mescalero or go to school, basically, uh, he went and prayed in front of this holy tree in his village where the monarch butterflies migrate from, migrate from Canada and they, they go to. And it's uh, basically like you, you don't chop them down. You can't hurt them. It's like, a, you know, it's, it's a superstitious thing. And um, that night he was praying in front of it to give him guidance. And then that night uh, there's a thunderstorm and this tree got struck by lightning and halved. And I went like, Oh, well, that doesn't make sense because you're here. So why didn't you take this negative sign? And I, we look over and he's turned the two halves of this holy tree into his two stills, which was wow. one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Wow. Um, really, really special. So this to me is just like a master doing his thing. This is a product that has been served to a group of people exclusively, and it's a, a uniform flavor profile. This is what they expect, and this is what they get every time. Um, so, but this is not the pachuga. No, this is just his straight, his this is his default. This is his bare bones alto. Got it. Got it. Which um, is phenomenal. Man, uh, my, my brain feels like it just went on. I know, I processed a lot of, uh, a, a wide range of information <laughs> there. Um, but here's, you know, you want to know my initial notes? This is a little sour. Mm-hmm. There's a sourness. Yeah, I get lime. Yeah, I get. It just 
Oh, I um, get like fermented, like almost yeah. uh, like um, pickled lime or like yeah. a soured sort of lime. Almost a little bit of. Uh, it could yeah, like it's pickled, pickled, pickled. I'm not, I'm not lime, sure pickled rind. what. It's the rind, but, though. Yeah. I get that right. rind and that pithiness of a yeah. lime, and I also get uh, a, that that sour, like tart sort of thing. It again. is these last two. It reminds little... me of like Cezanne, uh or even some type of sour beers. Yeah, uh, in, yeah. In, in that sort of fermentation range of uh, you know. Weird, peculiar. Sour. That's the word I'm going to use. Yeah, this is a peculiar. Um, this is, but, but really... yeah, it's still nicely, nicely rounded, smoky and fruity too. I, I think it's just it's a, that's just kind of behind this incredible layer of this pickled, given f- fermented thing. Given yeah. the rarity of the two last two we tried, and probably the inability to find them on your everyday or even maybe online, um, I do like this one better than the last one. I will agree with that. Yes, um, I mean this is from, special from a uh, from a purely like what could I drink more of neat yeah. perspective. Uh, but both wildly. I'll just say it. I want to have it with tacos. Yeah, like not? I just it just it just seems that that citrusy fermenty thing just seems like if I can have some stewed meat. And then some of this, it just, that's the compliment. Maybe that's I, how I, I find it more it. palatable. I think this is, I'm, I am going to grade this one and I give it an A minus. I'm at like that 90 uh, mark because I think it really has a fascinating uh, deviation from that sort of sweeter, smokier agave spirit or mezcal. It really has, um, this is, this is, to me, everything you spoke about, Max, with uh, differentiation and process, and, and this is really um, exploring what mezcal could be yeah, right. uh, versus what everyone thinks it should be. And that's the whole point. You know, it's, it's that these people have been doing this for this long. They have, all have different, differentiating opinions on what their product should be. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's whatever they want it to be. You know, it's a story yeah. of their culture. It's a story of a time. It's a place. It's a plant. It's and, in this case, a person uh, yeah. Do, experimenting and, and having fun. Like you said, rocking out and being a rock star. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I don't know. And that to me, and, and that's just why I didn't want to just bring you guys a bunch of weird, pretty things. You know, it's because <laughs> the whole thing is that like whose story is pretty and perfect everyone's story is expressive and this to me shows that it's beautiful it's fruity it's sour it's lactic it's yeah but at the same time you know it's 50 percent alcohol and it doesn't taste like it to me oh so. you know oh, what gosh, I, I didn't even think even about, talk that. about that there's uh, <laughs> yeah. i wouldn't have even guessed there's no heat on this whatsoever no, i would have very, never guessed very whatsoever smooth, that it very palatable uh, um yeah. Yeah, man, I, I think the the acidic uh, part of this is really that down a brings bit. Uh, a whole nother level to it. Um, you know, this was an amazing tasting. I really think my my mind is like I'm gonna have to like process this for days because I just <laughs> well, it's I feel so like I just took reaching. I, I just mean, took gosh. a college course yeah, in like an hour or two hours. Yeah, how long no we've been kidding. here? But you know, I know Max, you're very passionate about the ethical process of agave cultivation, agricultural, you know, the way that people um, operate in the industry and having mm-hmm. been down there. How many times have you been down there? Oh, I mean, a multitude, probably yeah. f- 15 times or so yeah, at this yeah, point. So yeah, so amazing. You you know, um, you know the players, you know the people, you know the industry. Um, you've been yeah. working with many Tlancaros and, you know, you're at the final end of the, of the supply chain. You're pouring this, you know, basically for people to consume mm-hmm. at the final level. Um, Tell us a little bit about in, in in your own kind of parting words here. What can people take away in term from your experiences? Tell us about the ethical agave and maybe tell people what they can do to sort of help this industry. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, you know, don't just because Americans are consuming a product doesn't mean that we need to Americanize it. You know, I think it's important to remember its roots, especially with mescal, because it is this finite thing. These plants take sometimes 15, 20, 25 years to grow. So the fact of the matter is, is that with a rise in popularity, they don't need it. They actually can't keep up with it. You know, so what we need to be mindful of is that we need to encourage these people to have proper agricultural products 
practices. The whole point is that, you know, you're supposed to be an 80 year old mescalero and you're supposed to be planting a plant that takes 25 years to grow because that plant was there for you and it needs to be there for the next generation. And that's very important is sustainability and, you know, not, not harvesting things too early and, also, you know, it's creating clear expectations for the American market, which is that this is special and it should be treated as something special. This shouldn't be something that I should throw in a margarita. This isn't something I should mix with soda water. And, and you know, quite frankly, I don't even think it's something you should put on ice. I think you should just drink it as is. Uh, which think, is how we've consumed today and, yeah. and, and, and thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, you don't go to uh, some dude in the middle of nowhere's backyard where he doesn't have plumbing and expect ice, right? He's drinking it out of a, a gourd that he's fashioned into a cup and, and that's what it is. And it's expressive. And, you know, as far as like tequila goes, I have a lot of very firm beliefs about how the people are being compensated, uh, like the hemidors. And I have a lot of strong opinions on modern commercialization as far as like diffuser usage, which we don't condone at my bar, which is basically the most modern medical advance or not medical, sorry, technical ad advancements in tequila production. And that's all based around longevity for the category. It's all based around not compromising the base product because of what we've turned it into, you know? And I just think at the end of the day, we need to s start treating spirits um, like we treat our food, you know, we want to know where it comes from. We want to know how this thing is grown. We don't want something that's full of chemicals. And the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of tequilas that are currently being served aren't tequilas. They're something that is an expressive plant that's been distilled so much that it's designed to taste like nothing. And then they make it taste like the chemicals that they add into it to make it uniform. You know, it's, it's people don't realize that Don Julio 1942 isn't even owned by Don Julio. It's an independent label that sources, blends, and regulates, you know, and and that's a high-end product, you know. It's like a real high-end product should be something that a person makes in limited quantity and it tells a story. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a product. It should be something that you are uh, treated to, to try, you know, and and something that's kind of crazy is, you know, it's like I, I stockpile whiskey like, like you do, you know, yeah, and, and, a bunch. <laughs> and, and, and I, uh, not, not to this extent, but, uh, I <laughs> no one I, does to this extent. Yeah. <laughs> I have a problem. I mean, I, I have a serious yeah, problem. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. But like, I don't know, like I, you know, people stockpile whiskey once a month. I take a bottle of mescal and I put it away and I don't open it and I have no plans on opening it. And the sad truth is, is that because in my heart of hearts, I believe with the way we're going in 20 years, some of these more obscure varietals of agave, gone. They get, they're gone. It's like, imagine opening a, imagine having a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley after Cabernet goes extinct. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's going to be, I mean, I, I know people that do that with rum. A lot of people yeah. are positioning and also, um, a lot of the Indian whiskeys that are ridiculously underpriced for the quality and, mm -hmm. you know, people are stockpiling some of the Amroots and, it's and, uh, it's delicious Rampur and some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's great stuff. And it's, you know, $56 for a bottle of a Rampur, you know, and supposedly these things are going to be very fucking gone <laughs> when uh people catch on and, and oh i like all kinds of whiskey from around the world or i mean look at japanese like whiskey right yeah Jap <laughs> japanese whiskey case in point i mean i'm i'm definitely not drinking my takatsuru as fast as i i started yeah. drinking it when i opened it because <laughs> uh -huh. it was everywhere two years ago but now you know that bottle has been at the halfway mark for a while yep. and like you know with rum it's the same thing you're getting 20 year old rums for under a hundred dollars but that may not be the case in 10, 15 years. So a lot of people are doing, Max, what you're doing with Mezcal, which is to uh, really put some of the stuff you, you that is special to you, you know, buy a bottle to drink, buy another bottle to save. And that's yeah. not, a, it's not a bad philosophy. And knowing how incredibly long it takes to make this stuff, how incredibly um, unprepared and underdeveloped uh, the industry is to service what the supply or so what the demand could be the supply yeah. cannot uh keep up yeah i know this for a fact mm -hmm. uh this and you've seen it firsthand the supply is not there for the demand it, the demand is barely even scratching you've seen the tip of the yeah. iceberg right now so if mezcal continues even on the trend it's on we will be running out of the rarer mezcals in in 
short time or yeah. short order. So, yeah. Um, I, I uh, thank you for telling, you know, sharing that stuff. And thank you for sharing these, these amazing, uh, men's calls with us. Uh, I, this was a, this was an amazing tasting. Um, uh, from a consumer standpoint, I really liked the, uh, the Bozal and from some of these rarer, more, um, harder to find ones. I really like the ancestral tequila. Oh yeah. Amazingly. It's delicious. Undeniably. Yep. Cam, yeah. party but, words. Uh, can I have more of the CM Bravais? Yeah. Uh, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, seriously. I, Max, a, a sincere thank you for all of your knowledge that you've shared. Um, it's obvious to anyone listening here that you're extremely passionate about this and uh, knowledgeable. Jesus Christ, man. Uh, yeah. Although I don't think he wants to hear this podcast. But. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, it's but he, because here's the thing. It's, it's one thing to have, you know, a, a, a level of information about something. And it's another thing to have the care about that. And you clear it comes through in everything that you've you've oh, said you. here today. Seriously, thank you so much for coming on, Max. It's, it's been an absolute blast, and and thanks for bringing this stuff. It's, it education. was a huge huge treat, and uh, yeah, thanks yeah, for having thanks, me. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. All, All right. right. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>Hello, everyone. Cameron and Seth here. Just a few more things before we wrap up. First, you can always head on over to cartelhour.com for the show notes, which will include links to all the spirits mentioned and, of course, consumed on the podcast. Absolutely. If you're interested in purchasing any of the spirits mentioned on the podcast, go ahead and click any of the links to be taken directly to those spirits or visit castcartel.com. They are America's largest online premium spirits marketplace and have been featured in Rolling Stones Magazine, Men's Journal, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Market Watch, and many others. Yeah, they are awesome and super mobile friendly too. They're a fantastic resource to search through different types of spirits and their platform is easy and straightforward. If you don't love driving around to every single liquor store in town and hoping they have what you're looking for, Cask Cartel is certainly the best e-commerce spirits platform I've personally come across. Couldn't agree more. And you can find them on social media at Cast Cartel, and you can find us at Cartel Hour for the podcast, where you can find information about upcoming episodes and live tastings at the Infusory. And speaking of those live tastings, for those living in or visiting the Los Angeles area that are truly intrigued, if you want to drink along with us, we would love to have you come and enjoy an evening at the Infusory to drink through a carefully selected assortment of spirits. We offer custom flights and have a robust library of over 700 spirits to choose from. Visit our website for more information on how to become a member of the Cartel Club. And if you're a spirits brand that would like to be featured on the podcast, please email us or send us a direct message on Instagram. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And remember to always drink responsibly and in good company.